For our final lecture for the week, we're going to talk a little bit uh, about ion movement and plant uptake. Now, admittedly, this lecture could be an entire semester's worth, um, but we really don't have the time and, and nor the focus of the class to think about exactly um, all the varied ways that plants have in terms of taking up and uh, acquiring nutrients. Um, you know, the discrepancy exists that there is a, the, the concentration of nutrients in the soil is very, very different than what's in plants. And so plants have various mechanisms to select for certain ions or certain nutrients versus others. And, um, you know, that's really specific to the, to the plant itself and to the environment that it lives in and, you know, lots and lots of factors involved in that. So um, this is really kind of a small attempt to intersect with what would be traditionally a, maybe a mineral nutrition of plants type of uh, course. Um, but I'm just going to kind of cover the highlights here, okay? So um, we talked a little bit about like ion exchange in soil, and we need to understand that uh, nutrients actually uh, move um, not surprisingly, there's a lot of different um, variability or nutrient specificity. Specificity, I can say that. Um, depending on like how fast it might move through the soil and, and what what uh, how tightly it's held or retained, et cetera, et cetera. And so, you know, some of these factors include the the charge. Not not surprisingly, um, if it's a cation or an anion the soil pH, the temperature, the moisture, the texture, uh, water dynamics in the soil, you know, the, the porosity of the soil, the pore structure, the pore spaces, lots of lots of things that might go into this. Um, anions, things like nitrate, NO3 minus, and sulfate, SO4, easily uh, move more easily than cations. And so we would consider a lot of these cations, chloride <coughs> and boric acid included, to be um, uh, mobile nutrients and that they would move through the soil relatively quickly. Um, and then because of the vast majority of the soil has negative charges relative to positive charges, uh, a lot of the cations might move uh, a little bit slower and be more immobile, okay? Um, and so you might suspect that, oh, well, this has a really large, you know, nutrient mobility in the soil has a large, uh, or is a big driver of if plants can access those nutrients or not. And there is definitely truth to that, but it's, um, you know, not that clean of a story. And we'll say that, um, just to, re you know, remind you uh, that, there's a lot of nutrient that's supplied from organic matter through microbial activity and nutrient cycling uh, from the decomposition of organic matter. And depending, again, on the nutrient, things like nitrogen and sulfur come primarily through the degradation of organic matter. So depending on like where this organic matter might be in the soil, where the distribution of microorganisms are, where the roots are, these things all, again, play, in, play into um, kind of this grand formula of how many nutrients or what's the fertility of that soil and what, what a crop's going to see or not see. Uh, we talk about movement of ions from the soil to the roots themselves, so right at that site of uptake. And there's really three main processes that this happens, okay? Or they can be broadly classified into three different different types of, of um, three different ways that this might happen. And so. Uh, generally, there, it's either going to be something classified as root interception, uh, as mass flow, or diffusion. Um, and, you know, thinking about the reality that there's a lot of, we talked about soil and that a lot of it is maybe half um, solid phase and then some air and water. And then this is kind of an incredible thing, which is quite true that roots typically, all, and this is in, say, an ag system, you know, maybe a field crop system. Thinking about the total volume of that soil and where the roots are, roots might occupy 1% to 3% of the total soil volume. And 
And if it's say it's like a perennial uh, field, you know that number is going to um, increase dramatically. But it's still uh, often a much smaller than than you think in terms of the total soil volume. So, what are the ways that roots actually? You know, what are the the mechanisms or the strategies that plants use to actually get nutrients to the roots? If you look over at this table again from the Havlin textbook, we have the root interception, mass flow, and diffusion, and then you can see depending on the nutrient, um, we can ignore you know this column here in terms of nutrients required for corn, but we can see you know the point of me showing this is depending on the nutrient, the the mechanism for plant uptake uh, is um, tremendously varied. So nitrogen, for example, 99% of that. Of the percentage supply is through mass flow, whereas for phosphorus, 94% is through diffusion. So these are again rough estimates, but kind of underscore, at least help illustrate that these different mechanisms, three different mechanisms, uh, generally are how uh, soil ions move from that soil solution to the plant root, where that site uh, at the root tip where the where that uptake is going to occur. Okay, So we'll talk about all three of them <clears throat> briefly. Root interception of ions is uh, through physical contact between root and the mineral surface. So it's really that root growing and as that root grows it's plucking ions off mineral surfaces. This is not particularly common, uh, a common way for uptake um, with kind of primary root structures, but that's why we have a lot of uh, root hairs we've talked about. Mycorrhizal fungi is another common strategy that plants use to essentially increase their, their, their foraging capacity, their nutrient foraging capacity. So more roots in soil, of course, the more soil volume, more nutrients that will be able to be taken up. And I'll just mention, you've likely encountered this before in other classes, but, you know, mycorrhizal fungi is a um, very important fungus in a lot of managed systems and, and non-managed systems alike, but it's a very ancient symbiotic association between uh, this mycorrhizal fungi and plant roots. And so um, that's demonstrated uh, through here where there's a, an incredibly complex amount of, of signaling that happens between the plant and the, the fungus, and then there's this really intimate uh, enveloping that happens between the, the, the mycorrhizal hyphae and the, actually the plant root cells. And so there's other associations uh, that occur as well that kind of um, are similar to this ectomycorrhizae uh, that are found in a much smaller number of species, but uh, this co-evolution that's happened. And both of these uh, my mycorrhizal fungi, both types will significantly increase essentially the rooting structure. And of course the symbiosis is um, the plant supplies the fungus carbon through photosynthate and then the fungus helps um, attain nutrients and phosphorus is, you know, the kind of the classic nutrient that we always think about with mycorrhizal fungi, but certainly um, other nutrients are important depending on the soil and the plant in the system. So root interception, actually physical, um, physical uh, connection and, and contact of that ion on the soil surface. The next one uh, is mass flow, okay, and this is important uh, particularly for nitrogen and sulfur, some for calcium and magnesium too. This is, um, mass flow is when ions are transported to the root with water. So mass flow and water. Um, you think about how water moves in the soil. Uh, it can be taken up um, via transpiration by the plant. So as plants are sucking water up as they're respiring, they're pulling water into the roots and then uh, of course ions are coming with that, nitrogen being one of those, nitrate being the, the most popular form. Um, water evaporation at the soil surface, again this kind of taking up and um, and then a percolation of water in the soil profile. So just different ways that water move and all those ways uh, moving to or from the roots and then bringing um, nutrients with that. So, and then of course the quantity of the nutrient that's available is often determined by the flow rate and how much uh, water uptake that plant is um, 
you know how much water that plant is actually consuming or taking up over time. And then finally, the, the third uh, way, the third category or, or strategy is through diffusion, okay? And so this is exactly as it sounds, a high concentration, moving from an area of high concentration to low concentration, this, you know, quote-unquote Brownian movement that, that helps facilitate diffusion, um, whether we like it or not. But uh, this is a, a process that um, is typically pretty slow. Uh, things like um, phosphorus and potassium are really important, primarily arrive through diffusion. So when we think about potassium and, and, and phosphorus, we often have to think about um, you know, potentially placing those nutrients close to the root so they don't have to go find them and scavenge. They're not going to move too much with water. Um, so diffusion and mass flow rely on the ability of the solid phase of the soil to replenish or buffer solution. Um, and <clears throat> they are important considerations for nutrient management, right? So uh, depending on the, the, the way that the ion reaches the root, we might think about managing those nutrients in a little bit different way. Um, <clears throat> once nutrients are at the root surface, they, are enter, they enter into the outermost root cells where they are transported to the plant, okay? And so this ion transport is really complicated. Uh, I mean, not always, of course, but uh, there's lots of different ways that plants have evolved, lots of mechanisms to actually take up those ions, take up those nutrients. And so those can be broadly classified into passive versus active, where um, you're moving into this, uh, you know, when it actually physically moves from outside the, the root and in, in, into the root. And uh, the difference between active and passive are really if, it's if it the requires act, uh, energy from the plant, if the plant's expending energy to uh, obtain those nutrients, it's considered an active process. Okay, so again, we're not going to spend, unfortunately, very much time on this. I'm not the person that uh, would be, you know, super qualified to teach this. There's others. There's other people uh, in the college that 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 take this on and do a much better job of this, but. Uh, passive transport, things like simple diffusion through membranes, going down the gradient like we, you know, we were just to talk, uh, discussing, and facilitated diffusion um, where specific proteins uh, of small uh, polar, um, small molecular weight ions uh, or molecules um, are facilitating down kind of uh, electrochemical or electromagnetic gradient. Okay, so. This would be considered passive. Sometimes uh, there's transporters or co-transporters actually in the root tip or in those cell walls that help facilitate some of that passive transfer, some of that diffusion. Um, and so again, you know, these are transporters that um, aren't, they're just kind of there. They, they don't really use uh, energy per se. I mean, you need energy to maintain and to build these transporters and co-transporters, but there's not an active energy exchange. On the flip side, and, and you know, in some ways, there's this is a, a nice clean division, but um, in the real world, um, there, again, there's a lot of enzymatic and metabolic complexity that is involved in this really fundamental skill or fundamental uh, activity for a plant in terms of gaining nutrients. So active transport is usually dealing with larger um, uh, larger molecules that um, for various uh, reasons have difficulty moving across membranes and so they require things like sugars or uh, amino acids um, or ATP to, to move them, right? So it's essentially expending energy to do this and so active transport across the selectively uh, permeable membrane occurs through ATP powered pumps that transport ions against their concentration gradients and so you know this brings us back to like uh, high school or whatever bio 101 and even biochemer you know those sorts of classes when, we're, when we learned about some of these mechanisms you know thinking about it for, at the plant level this is um, what what happens and so it's this hydrolysis of ATP, it's the using of ATP, um, that currency of energy in the plant to, uh, to help move these, these nutrients from uh, into a, you know, down that concentration gradient. So it requires energy for that.
Okay. So, uh, I'm going to end. I've got um, just another slide or two. And I you know, want to just kind of point out this um, generalized relationship we've already talked a little bit about. But, um, you know, there's this idea, and this could be nutrient concentration in a, in a plant tissue. It could be nut nutrient concentration in the soil, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but this kind of generalized relationship happens where we have um, plant yield or plant productivity that's compromised as that nutrient concentration gets really low. And then what happens, uh, so that's technically deficient. At some point, as that nutrient concentration increases, it gets to a critical range where it, it hits sufficiency. And so more nutrient in the soil or in the plant tissue don't have really any impact on yield or any impact on productivity. But what happens is plants have evolved uh, to, you know, get it while the, the getting's good. And so they will take up uh, more nutrients than are required. And that's a process that we call luxury consumption. Um, and it's simply an, a, a, an adaptive strategy for plants to kind of store nutrients when there's available and then they can re remobilize that or use that in other other means um, if um, access to that nutrient becomes um, becomes limiting okay so the luxury consumption is when the tissue concentration continues to increase but the the plant is not doing anything different like the yield is or the plant productivity is the same and then, of course, there's always such a thing as too much of a good thing, and that's when <clears throat> nutrient concentrations increase to the point where they become excessive or toxic and even, you know, starting, that would be defined as like starting to hurt plant function, okay? So we'll end our first week of lectures just talking about some of these definitions, and we can reference this, go back and reference this, um, you know, diagram to kind of look at this and visualize this, internalize this, but... You know, some of the terms that we use, deficiency uh, when there is a nutrient limitation, right? Critical range occurs at that concentration. Uh, that's kind of like the, the leverage point where uh, below that there's a deficiency and above that it's fine. Okay, so, and this, this graph shows it, um, I mean, it's realistic in the sense that it's not just this clean break that happens, but there's a bit of a plateau. So if you try to describe this mathematically, it might be a quadratic and it might be right where this joint point is, okay? And then sufficient uh, nutrient concentration, if we add additional nutrients, uh, it's not gonna increase yield. But then again, when we become excessive or toxic, um, it's too much of a good thing and, and uh, the concentration increases high enough where it starts to be detrimental to plant metabolism. So uh, those are, you know, some basic definitions. Um, we'll end there. We'll pick up in week two with uh, soil acidity. So again, the, the last, you know, this, the first set of lectures is really trying to frame uh, the, uh, the semester and what we're, what we're talking about. So hopefully uh, you've got a clear picture of, you know, what this is going to be about and where we're going moving forward.